Nog 19 dagen en dan weten we na een intense verkiezingscampagne wie de nieuwe president is van de Verenigde Staten van Amerika. Wordt het Hillary Clinton? Ze heeft heel veel politieke kilometers op haar teller, maar ze is toch geen onbeschreven blad. Op dit moment staat ze in alle peilingen voor op haar rivaal Donald Trump. De omstreden anti-establishment kandidaat die ons toch nog in alle spanning ja, aan het wachten houdt. Want wat wordt zijn volgende zet na alle heisa van afgelopen dagen? Het is een vraag die ik voorleg aan onze Amerika-watcher Björn Soenes, die ook dit derde en allerlaatste debat samen met u en mij meekijkt naar dit debat tussen Hillary Hillary Clinton en Donald Trump. Fijn dat u er weer bij bent vannacht. Dit is Amerika kiest. Hillary Clinton is going to be a horrible president. Imagine him in the Oval Office. Crooked Hillary, crooked Hillary. He is temperamentally unfit. Ja, Björn, all eyes on Trump. Alle ogen op Trump vannacht. Hè? Ja, de vraag is hoe laag zal hij gaan? Zullen onze ogen en oren alweer pijn doen hè, na het tweede debat, wat een absoluut dieptepunt was in de, de politieke geschiedenis van Amerika? Hoe laag zullen ze beide vanavond gaan? Zal het over en weer eh, geteuter en over en weer verwijten weer doorgaan? We weten het niet, want dit is de verkiezing van de onverwachte gebeurtenis. Dat kan je wel zeggen. Trump ligt zo ver achter dat hij eigenlijk niets meer te verliezen heeft. Niets meer te verliezen. Zes procent zou je achterliggen? Gemiddeld. Gemiddeld. De meeste peilingen zijn zeven, acht procent verschil overal achter in strijd staat, dus het kan een afslachting worden. Maar er is niet veel meer nodig om de peiling weer te doen keren. Maar hoe hij Toch? dat zal doen, hij kan dat doen, maar dan moet hij vanavond wel enorme prestaties leveren. En de vraag is, zal dat helpen? Want de meeste mensen hebben hun gedachten al vastgelegd. De vraag is ook, hoe zal Clinton reageren? Zij moet eigenlijk niet al te veel doen, ze moet rustig blijven. Terugberekend en goed voorbereid, zoals altijd, zoals we Hillary Clinton kennen. En iets meer ten aanval trekken dan in het tweede debat. In het tweede debat had zij niet langer het initiatief. Dat lag bij Trump. In het eerste debat had zij dat wel. En Trump moest in de verdediging. En we weten allemaal, als ze zich aangevallen voelt, dan begint hij ja, uit te halen. En dan heeft hij zichzelf niet altijd onder controle. Dus daar moeten we op letten. En hopelijk gaat het ook weer over... Onderwerpen. Er zijn zes onderwerpen vanavond. Vertel eens. Uh, dat moet gaan over immigratie. Het moet gaan over buitenlandse hotspots, dus uh, moeilijke gebieden, Syrië, Irak, ja. Afghanistan, IS. Het moet ook gaan over het Hoge Rechtshof. Dat is belangrijk, omdat daar een rechter moet benoemd worden, die al sinds februari is overleden, die moet vervangen worden. De Republikeinen houden dat tegen. Dat is belangrijk voor de toekomst van de rechtspraak in ja. de VS. En het zal gaan over schulden in Amerika en over uitkeringen voor uh, mensen die het sociaal moeilijk hebben. Oké. Okay. De, de debatleider is een strenge debatleider. Iemand die de mensen roostert. Chris Wallace van Fox News. Fox News, conservatieve televisiezender. Dat is cruciaal. Speelt ook in het voorbeeld van, voordeel liever van Trump vannacht? Ja en nee. Hij is zogezegd ooit de vriend geweest van Fox. Maar Chris Wallace staat bekend dat hij zelfs harder is voor democraten dan voor republikeinen. Als hij ze, of voor republikeinen, republikeinen dan, voor dan voor democraten. Als hij ja. ze interviewt. Dus hij staat wel bekend als een zeer goed journalist. Als iemand die doorvraagt en roostert. De vraag is... Hoe gaat Clinton daarmee om als ze geroosterd wordt over Wikileaks, over de video die gelekt is, waarbij blijkt dat ook zij in haar campagne vuile technieken gebruikt om Trump-rallies te verstoren? Ja. Hoe gaat uh, Trump reageren als hij geroosterd wordt over de aanklachten van vrouwen enzovoort? Dus hopelijk gaat het niet te veel over persoonlijke dingen, maar gaat het ook ergens over de toekomst van Amerika. En op het einde zullen ze voor het allerlaatst de, de, de natie kunnen toespreken met hun boodschap voor de Amerikanen. Waarom hij of zij ja. de president mag worden voor, uh, voor uh, het Witte Huis. Hè? Um, je spreekt over onderwerpen. Um, welk onderwerp spreekt in deze in het voordeel van, van Trump? Ik, ik denk dan aan immigratie. Um, Tuurlijk, immigratie. immigratie hè, de 11 miljoen illegalen waar hij streng wil tegen optreden. Ook de schulden. Amerika heeft ondertussen een totale schuld van bijna 20.000 miljard dollar. Dat is heel veel. Um, wat gaat er gebeuren? Welke beleidsinitiatieven moeten er komen om die schuld naar beneden te helpen? Hij kan dat goed managen, want hij is een manager, een, 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 een ja, ondernemer, zo zegt hij altijd. Ja en nee, maar als je kijkt naar de programma's, dan uh, stelt Trump een belastingverlaging voor zowat iedereen voor. Dus dan zou de schuld wel eens nog met een paar duizend miljard kunnen toenemen. Dus ja, die, die programma's moeten ook betaald worden als je beleid voert. Dus daar kan hij dan weer geroosterd worden door, door de moderator. Ja, de moderator. Trouwens, wordt dit weer een psychologische oorlogsvoering? Ik heb gezien dat Trump ook een speciale gast heeft uitgenodigd um, vannacht. De halfbroer, de Keniaanse halfbroer van uh, ja. president Obama. Maar, Malik Obama is de halfbroer inderdaad van de president. 
is nooit een grote uh, fan geweest van zijn broer en is eigenlijk een republikein en is voor Trump, omdat hij vindt dat zijn broer het niet al te best heeft gedaan. Die is uitgenodigd samen met de moeder van een slachtoffer van de aanslag van uh, een terreuraanslag in Benghazi, waar vier Amerikanen zijn omgekomen. Mm -hmm. En de moeder van uh, een jonge man die daar is omgekomen, zit daar ook en die is... Die, die stelt Clinton persoonlijk verantwoordelijk voor de dood van haar zoon. Maar dat is dan psychologisch. Die mensen mogen niet, zoals in nee. het tweede debat, ook nee. een vraag stellen. Nee. Uh, het enige wat we weten uh, is dat er is één moderator is. Er is publiek, maar dat publiek moet stil zijn. heeft geen inbreng. Het is dus een beetje zoals het eerste debat. Journalist ondervraagt uh, de kandidaten drie keer of zes keer een kwartier over een onderwerp. Iedere keer twee minuten spreektijd, een minuut doorgaan. Maar de vraag is... We hebben twee kandidaten gezien die elkaar voortdurend onderbreken, vooral Trump, in hoeverre hij dat in de hand zal kunnen houden. Hij onderbreekt de moderator, heeft ook heel veel kritiek op de moderator. Vraag is of hij dat ook zal hebben op de huidige moderator van Fox, maar ook op de verkiezingen aan ja, zich. Dat is één grote grap volgens Trump. Zeer gevaarlijk. Ja, hij, hij zit constant um, het bericht de wereld in te sturen dat deze verkiezing nu al vervalst is. Zeer ja, gevaarlijk dat, waarom? Gevaarlijk om als hij inderdaad verliest hebben zijn aanhangers of een deel van zijn aanhangers al gezegd wij gaan stampij maken, we gaan ruzie maken, we gaan uh, vechtpartijen organiseren. Wij aanvaarden de uitslag niet. Dat zou de eerste keer zijn in de geschiedenis van de VS dat een kandidaat, als hij rechtmatig verliest, zijn verlies niet erkent. En dat is toch wel uh, dubieus. En eigenlijk is dat ook al een beetje de witte vlag uitsteken. Van hij voelt dat hij aan het verliezen is... Is er nog een weg om te winnen? Hij weet het niet, maar hij zegt vooraf al dat het vervalst is. Dus als hij verliest, heeft hij al een excuus om te zeggen ja, het stond vooraf vast dat ik moest verliezen. Hij is wanhopig? Stilaan wel, denk ik, want de peilingen, ook de interne peilingen, zijn zeer slecht. Uh, hoe dat komt, weten we niet. Het zou kunnen liggen aan zijn seksistische uitspraken, die toch veel meer weerklank en veel meer uh, effect hebben gehad dan vermoed. Maar uh, in elk geval, op drie weken tijd is de kans dat hij president wordt gezakt van pakweg uh, 50% of 40% naar een goede 10%. Dus dat is eigenlijk bijna onmogelijk om Jor, te winnen. Het debat is nog niet begonnen, maar kan jij nu al zeggen dat de race eigenlijk is beslist? Het is moeilijk om nee. die uitspraak te maken. Ja en nee. De peilingen zijn peilingen. En in normale verkiezingen zou je kunnen zeggen... Kijk, de vorige verkiezing, um, Obama tegen Romney, lag um, Obama op het einde 0,7% voor. Bijna niet... Uiteindelijk was dat 4 procent. Dus als we die redenering doortrekken en het is nu 6, 7 procent, zou het wel eens 10, 11 kunnen worden. Ja, ik, de vraag hoor, is... ik hoor dat het debat is begonnen, dus ik stel voor ja, dat we meteen absoluut. gaan kijken naar het debat dat zal plaatsvinden nu in Las Vegas, Nevada, aan die Universiteit van Nevada. Het allerlaatste debat tussen Hillary Clinton en Donald Trump. Benieuwd wat dat wordt. We gaan naar het debat. Secretary Clinton, Mr. Trump, welcome. Let's get right to it. The first topic is the Supreme Court. We, you both talked briefly about the court in the last debate, but I want to drill down on this because the next president will almost certainly have at least one appointment and likely or possibly two or three appointments, which means that you will, in effect, determine the balance of the court for what could be the next quarter century. First of all, where do you want to see the court take the country? And secondly, what's your view on how the Constitution should be interpreted? Is, do the founders' words mean what they say, or is it a living document <clears throat> to be applied flexibly according to changing circumstances? In this segment, Secretary Clinton, you go first. You have two minutes. Thank you very much, Chris, and thanks to UNLV for hosting us. You know, I think when we talk about the Supreme Court, it really raises the central issue in this election. Namely, what kind of country are we going to be? What kind of opportunities will we provide for our citizens? What kind of rights will Americans have? And I feel strongly that the Supreme Court needs to stand on the side of the American people, not on the side of the powerful corporations and the wealthy. For me, that means that we need a Supreme Court that will stand up on behalf of women's rights, on behalf of the rights of the LGBT community, that will stand up and say no to Citizens United, a decision that has 
undermined the uh, election system in our country because of the way it permits dark, unaccountable money to come into uh, our electoral system. I have major disagreements with my opponent about these issues and others that will be before the Supreme Court. But I feel that at this point in our country's history, uh, it is important that we not reverse marriage equality, that we not reverse Roe v. Wade, that we stand up against Citizens United, we stand up for the rights of people in the workplace, that we stand up and basically say, the Supreme Court should represent all of us. That's how I see the court and the kind of people that I would be looking to uh, nominate to the court uh, would be in the great tradition of standing up to the powerful, standing up on behalf of our rights as Americans. And I look forward to having that opportunity. I would hope that the Senate would do its job and confirm the nominee that President Obama has sent to them. That's the way the Constitution fundamentally should operate. The President nominates and then the Senate advises and consents or not, but they go forward with the process. Secretary Clinton, thank you. Mr. Trump, same question. Where do you want to see the court take the country and how do you believe the Constitution should be interpreted? Well, first of all, it's uh, great to be with you, and thank you, everybody. The Supreme Court, it's what it's all about. Our country is so, so, it's just so imperative that we have the right justices. Something happened recently where Justice Ginsburg uh, made some very, very inappropriate statements toward me and toward a tremendous number of people, many, many millions of people that I represent, and she was forced to apologize, and apologize she did. But these were statements that should never, ever have been made. We need a Supreme Court that, in my opinion, is going to uphold the Second Amendment and all amendments, but the Second Amendment, which is under absolute siege. Uh, I believe if my opponent should win this race, which I truly don't think will happen, uh, we will have a Second Amendment, which will be a very, very small replica of what it is right now. But I feel that it's absolutely important that we uphold because of the fact that it is under such uh, trauma. Uh, I feel that the uh, justices that I am going to appoint, and I've named 20 of them, the justices that I'm going to appoint will be pro-life. They will have a conservative bent. Uh, they will be protecting the Second Amendment. They are great scholars in all cases, and they're people of tremendous respect. Uh, they will interpret the Constitution the way the founders wanted it interpreted, and I believe that's very, very important. I don't think we should have justices appointed that decide what they want to hear. It's all about the Constitution of, of and, and so important, the Constitution the way it was meant to be, and those are the people that I will appoint. Mr. Trump, thank you. We now have about 10 minutes for an open discussion. I want to focus on two issues that, in fact, by the justices that you name, could end up changing the existing law of the land. First is one that you mentioned, Mr. Trump, and that is guns. Secretary Clinton, you said last year, and let me quote, the Supreme Court is wrong on the Second Amendment. And now, in fact, in the 2008 Heller case, the court ruled that there is a constitutional right to bear arms, but a, a right that is reasonably limited. Those were the words of the, uh, of the judge, Antonin Scalia, who wrote the decision. What's wrong with that? Well, first of all, I support the Second Amendment. I lived in Arkansas for 18 wonderful years. I represented upstate New York. I understand and respect the tradition of gun ownership. It goes back to the founding of our country. Uh, but I also believe that there can be and must be reasonable regulation. Um, because I support the Second Amendment doesn't mean that I want people who shouldn't have guns to be able to threaten you, kill you or members of your family. And so when I think about what we need to do, we have 33,000 people a year who die from guns. I think we need comprehensive background checks, need to close the online loophole, close the uh, gun show loophole. There's other matters that I think are sensible, that are the kind of reforms that would make a difference, that are not in any way conflicting with the Second Amendment. You mentioned the Heller decision, and what I was saying uh, that you referenced, Chris, 
was that I disagreed with the way the court applied the Second Amendment in that case, because what the District of Columbia was trying to do was to protect toddlers from guns. And so they wanted people with guns to safely store them. And the court didn't accept that reasonable regulation, but they've accepted many others. So I see no conflict between saving people's lives and defending the Second Amendment. Let me bring Mr. Trump in here. The bipartisan open debate coalition got millions of votes on questions to ask here. And this was, in fact, one of the top questions that uh, they got. How will you ensure the Second Amendment is protected? You just heard Secretary Clinton's answer. Does she persuade you that while you may disagree on regulation, that in fact she supports a Second Amendment right to bear arms? Well, the D.C. versus Heller decision uh, was very strongly, and she was extremely angry about it. I watched. I mean, she was very, very angry when upheld. And uh, Justice Scalia was... Uh, so involved, and it was a well-crafted decision. But Hillary was extremely upset, extremely angry, and people that believe in the Second Amendment and believe in it very strongly were very upset with what she had to say. Well, let me, let me bring in Secretary Clinton. Uh, were you extremely upset? Well, I was upset because, unfortunately, dozens of toddlers uh, injure themselves, even kill people with guns, because, unfortunately, not everyone who... Um, has loaded guns in their homes, takes appropriate precautions. But there's no doubt that I respect the Second Amendment, that I also believe there's an individual right to bear arms. That is not in conflict with sensible, common-sense regulation. And, you know, look, I understand that Donald's been uh, strongly supported by the NRA, the gun lobby's on his side, they're running millions of dollars of ads against me, and I regret that, because what I would like to see is for people to come together and say, of course we're going to protect and defend the Second Amendment, but we're going to do it in a way that tries to save some of these 33,000 lives that we lose every well, year. Let me bring Mr. Trump back into that, because in fact you oppose any limits on assault weapons, any limits on high capacity magazines. You support a national right to carry law. Why, sir? Well, let me just tell you, before we go any further, in Chicago, which has the toughest gun laws in the United States, probably you could say by far, they have more gun violence than any other city. So we have the toughest laws, and you have tremendous gun violence. I am a very strong supporter of the Second Amendment, and I am, I don't know if Hillary was saying it in a sarcastic manner, but I'm very proud to have the endorsement of the NRA, and it's the earliest endorsement they've ever given to anybody who ran for president. So I'm very honored by all of that. Uh, we are going to appoint justices. This is the best way to help the Second Amendment. We are going to appoint justices that will feel very strongly about the Second Amendment, that will not do damage to the Second Amendment. Well, let's pick up on another issue which divides you and the justices that whoever ends up winning this election appoints could have a dramatic effect that there, and that's the issue of abortion. Right. Mr. Trump, you're pro-life, but I, I want to ask you specifically, do you want the court, including the justices that you will name, to overturn Roe v. Wade, which includes, in fact states, a woman's right to abortion? Well, if that would happen, because I am pro-life and I will be appointing pro-life judges, I would think that that will go back to the individual states. But I'm asking you specifically, would you if like to... If they overturned it, it'll go back to the states. But what I'm asking you, sir, is do you want to see the court overturned? You just said you want to see the court protect the Second Amendment. Do you want to see the court overturn Roe Well, v. if Wade? we put another two or perhaps three justices on, that's really what's going to be... Ha that will happen. And that'll happen automatically, in my opinion, because I am putting pro-life justices on the court. I will say this. It will go back to the states and the states will then make a determination. Secretary Clinton. Well, I, I strongly support Roe v. Wade, which guarantees a constitutional right to a woman to make the most intimate, most difficult, in many cases, decisions about her health care that uh, one can imagine. And in this case, it's not only about Roe v. Wade. It is about what's happening right now in America. So many states are putting very stringent regulations on women that block them from exercising that choice to the extent that they are defunding Planned Parenthood, which 
of course, provides all kinds of cancer screenings and other benefits for uh, women in our country. Donald has said he's in favor of defunding Planned Parenthood. He even supported shutting the government down to defund Planned Parenthood. I will defend Planned Parenthood. I will defend Roe v. Wade, and I will defend women's rights to make their own health care decisions. Secretary and we Clinton. have come too far to have that turn back now. And in, indeed, he said women should be punished, that there should be some form of punishment uh, for women uh, who obtain abortions. And I could just not be more opposed to that kind of thinking. I, I'm going to give you a chance to respond. But I want to ask you, Secretary Clinton, I want to explore how far you believe the right to abortion goes. You have been quoted as saying that the fetus has no constitutional rights. You also voted against a ban on late-term partial birth abortions. Why? Because Roe v. Wade very clearly sets out that there can be regulations on abortion so long as the life and the health of the mother are taken into account. And when I voted as a senator, I did not think that that was the case. The kinds of cases that fall at the end of pregnancy are often the most heartbreaking, painful decisions for families to make. I have met with women who, have, toward the end of their pregnancy, get the worst news one could get, that their health is in jeopardy if they continue to carry to term, or that something terrible has happened or just been discovered uh, about the pregnancy. I do not think the United States government should be stepping in and making those most personal of decisions. So you can regulate if you are doing so with the life and the health of the mother taken into account. Mr. Trump, your reaction, and particularly on this issue of late-term partial birth Well, abortion. I think it's terrible. Uh, if you go with what Hillary is saying, in the ninth month, you can take the baby and rip the baby out of the womb of the mother just prior to the birth of the baby. Now, you can say that that's okay, and Hillary can say that that's okay, but it's not okay with me. Because based on what she's saying and based on where she's going and where she's been, you can take the baby and rip the baby out of the womb in the ninth month on the final day. And that's not acceptable. Well, that is not what happens in these cases. And using that kind of uh, scare rhetoric is just terribly unfortunate. You should meet with some of the women that I've met with, women I've known over the course of my life. This is one of the worst possible choices that any woman and her family has to make. And I do not believe the government should be making it. You know, I've had the great honor of traveling across the world on behalf of our country. I've been to countries where governments either forced women to have abortions like they used to do in China or forced women to bear children like they used to do in Romania. And I can tell you the government has no business in the decisions that women make with their families in accordance with their faith, with medical advice, and I will stand up for that right. All right. But just briefly, I want to move on and to another honestly, segment. nobody has business doing what I just said, doing that as late as one or two or three or four days prior to birth. Nobody has that. All right. Let's move on to the subject of immigration. Uh, and there is almost no issue that separates the two of you more than the issue of immigration. Actually, there are a lot of issues that separate <laughs> the two of you. Mr. Trump, you want to build a wall. Secretary Clinton, you have offered no specific plan for how you want to secure our southern border. Mr. Trump, you are calling for major deportations. Secretary Clinton, you say that within your first 100 days as president, you're going to offer a package that includes a pathway to citizenship. Uh, the question really is, why are you right and your opponent wrong? Mr. Trump, you go first in this segment. You have two minutes. Well, first of all, she wants to give amnesty, which is a disaster and very unfair to all of the people that are waiting in line for many, many years. We need strong borders. In the audience tonight, we have four mothers of, I mean, these are unbelievable people that I've gotten to know over a period of years whose children have been killed, brutally killed, by people that came into the country illegally. You have thousands of mothers and fathers and relatives all over the country. They're coming in illegally. Drugs are pouring in through the border. We have no country if we have no border. Hillary wants to give amnesty. She wants to have open borders. The border secure, as you know, the Border Patrol agent, 16,500 plus ICE last week, 
endorsed me. First time they've ever endorsed a candidate. It means their job is tougher. But they know what's going on. They know it better than anybody. They want strong borders. They feel we have to have strong borders. I was up in New Hampshire the other day. The biggest complaint they have, it's with all of the problems going on in the world, many of the problems caused by Hillary Clinton and by Barack Obama, all of the problems, their single biggest problem is heroin that pours across our southern borders, just pouring and destroying their youth. It's poisoning the blood of their youth and plenty of other people. We have to have strong borders. We have to keep the drugs out of our country. We are, right now, we're getting the drugs, they're getting the cash. We need strong borders. We need absolute, we cannot give amnesty. Now, I want to build the wall. We need the wall. The Border Patrol, ICE, they all want the wall. We stop the drugs. We, we shore up the border. One of my first acts will be to get all of the drug lords, all of the bad ones. We have some bad, bad people in this country that have to go out. We're going to get them out, we're going to secure the border, and once the border is secured, at a later date, we'll make a determination as to the rest. But we have some bad hombres here, and we're going to get them out. Mr. Trump, thank you. Same question to you, Secretary Clinton. Basically, why are you right? Mr. Trump is wrong. Well, as he was talking, I was thinking about a young girl I met here in Las Vegas, Carla. Uh, who was very worried that her parents might be deported because uh, she was born in this country, but they were not. They work hard. They do everything they can to give her a good life. And you're right. I don't want to rip families apart. I don't want to be sending parents away from children. I don't want to see the deportation force that Donald has talked about in action in our country. We have 11 million undocumented people. They have 4 million American citizen children, 15 million people. He said as recently as a few weeks ago in Phoenix that every undocumented person would be subject to deportation. Now, here's what that means. It means you would have to have a massive law enforcement presence where law enforcement officers would be going school to school, home to home, business to business, rounding up people who are undocumented and we would then have to put them on trains, on buses, to get them out of our country. I think that is a, an idea that is not in keeping with who we are as a nation. I think it's an idea that would rip our country apart. I have been for border security for years. I voted for border security in the United States Senate. And my comprehensive immigration reform plan, of course, includes border security. But I want to put our resources where I think they're most needed, getting rid of any violent person. Anybody who that would be good. If the United States got along well and went after ISIS, that would be good. He has no respect for her. He has no respect for our president. And I'll tell you what, we're in very serious trouble because we have a country with tremendous numbers of nuclear warheads, 1,800, by the way, where they expanded and we didn't. 1,800 nuclear warheads, and she's playing chicken. Look, Putin, well, wait, wait, from but, everything I see, has no respect for this person. Well, that's because he'd rather have a puppet as president of no the United puppet, States. No puppet, no puppet. It's pretty, clear, you're the puppet. it's pretty clear you won't admit no, you're that the, the Russians have engaged in cyber attacks against the United States of America, that you encouraged espionage against our people, that you are willing to spout the Putin line, sign up for his wish list, break up NATO, do whatever he wants to do, and that you continue to get help from him because he has a very clear favorite in this race. So I think that this is such an unprecedented uh, situation. We've never had a foreign government trying to interfere in our election. We have 17, 17 intelligence agencies, civilian and military, who have all concluded that these espionage attacks, these cyber attacks, come from the highest levels of the Kremlin, 
and they are designed to influence our election. I find that deeply disturbing, Secretary and Clinton. I think it's she time. She has no you idea whether it's Russia, it, China, or anybody else. I am else. not quoting she has myself. No idea. I am quoting Hillary, you 17, have no idea. 17 intelligence. Do you doubt 17 our, our military has and no civilian idea. agencies? Well, yeah, he'd I doubt rather it. believe I doubt it. Vladimir Putin than the military and civilian intelligence professionals who are sworn to protect us. I find that just Se absolutely She doesn't right. like Mr. Putin Trump. because Putin Mr. has out smarted her at every Mr. step Trump, of the way. I, I, Excuse I, me. Mr. Putin has Mr. outsmarted Trump, her in Mr. Syria. Trump, He's outsmarted her here. every I do get step to, of the way. I do get to ask some questions. Yes, And fine. I would like to ask you this direct question. The top national security officials of this country do believe that Russia has been behind these hacks. Even if you don't know for sure whether they are, do you condemn any interference by Russia in the American election? By Russia or anybody else. You condemn their interference? Of course I condemn. Of course I can. I don't know Putin. I have I'm no not idea. Asking, I'm asking I you never met death. Putin. This is not my best friend. But if the United States got along with Russia, wouldn't be so bad. Let me tell you, Putin has outsmarted her and Obama at every single step of the way, whether it's Syria, no, you name it, missiles. Take a look at the startup that they signed. The Russians have said, according to many, many reports, I can't believe they allowed us to do this. They create warheads and we can't. The Russians can't believe it. She has been outsmarted by Putin and all you have to do is look at the Middle East. They've taken over. We've spent six trillion dollars. They've taken over the Middle East. She has been outsmarted and outplayed worse than anybody I've ever seen in any government we're, whatsoever. We're a long way away from immigration, but I'm going to let you finish this topic. Well, you got I've, about I, 45 seconds. Yeah, and she always I, will be. I, I find it uh, ironic that he's raising nuclear uh, weapons. This is a person who has been very cavalier, even casual, about the use of nuclear weapons. He's Wrong. advocated more countries getting them, Japan, Korea, even Saudi Arabia. He said, well, if we have them, why don't we use them, which I think is uh, terrifying. But here's the deal. The bottom line on nuclear weapons is that when the president gives the order, it must be followed. There's about four minutes between the order being given and the people responsible for launching nuclear weapons to do so. And that's why 10 people who have had that awesome responsibility have come out and in an unprecedented way said they would not trust Donald Trump with the nuclear codes or to have his finger on the nuclear button. I have 200 Very generals quickly. and admirals, 21 endorsing me, 21 Congressional Medal of Honor recipients. As far as Japan and other countries, we are being ripped off by everybody in the world. We're defending other countries. We are spending a fortune doing it. They have the bargain of the century. All I said is we have to renegotiate these agreements because our country cannot afford to defend Saudi Arabia, Japan, Germany, South Korea, and many other places. We cannot continue to afford. She took that as saying okay. nuclear weapons. Look, she's been proven to be a liar on so many different ways. This is just another lie. Well, I'm just quoting you uh, when there's you were no asked quote. About You're not going to find a quote from nuclear, me. Nuclear. Uh, uh, competition in Asia, you said, you know, go ahead, enjoy yourselves, folks. That kind of And defend of language, yourselves. That, well, and defend United yourselves. States I didn't say nuclear. And defend yourself. The United States has kept the peace through our alliances. Donald wants to tear up our alliances. I think it makes the world safer, and frankly, it makes the United States safer. I would work with our allies in Asia, in Europe, in the Middle East, and elsewhere. That's the only way we're going to be we're gonna, able to no, keep we're gonna, peace. We are going to move on to the next topic, which is the economy. And I hope <laughs> we handle that as well as we did immigration. Uh, you also have very different ideas about how to get the economy growing faster. Secretary Clinton, in your plan, government plays a big role. Uh, you see more government spending, more entitlements, more tax credits, more tax penalties. Uh, Mr. Trump, you want to get government out with lower taxes and less regulation. Yes. We're going to drill down into this a little bit more, but in, in this overview, please explain to me why you believe that your plan will create more jobs and growth for this country and your opponent's plan will not. 
in this round, you go for a Secretary Clinton. Well, I think when the middle class thrives, America thrives. And so my plan is based on growing the economy, giving middle class families many more opportunities. Uh, I want us to have the biggest jobs program since World War II, jobs in infrastructure and advanced manufacturing. I think we can compete with high wage countries, and I believe we should. New jobs in clean energy, not only to fight climate change, which is a serious problem, but to create new opportunities and new businesses. I want us to do more to help small business. That's where two thirds of the new jobs are going to come from. I want us to raise the national minimum wage because people who live in poverty should not, uh, who work full time, should not still be in poverty. And I sure do want to make sure women get equal pay for the work we do. I feel strongly that we have to have an education system that starts with preschool and goes through college. That's why I want more technical education in high schools and in community colleges, real apprenticeships to prepare young people for the jobs of the future. I want to make college debt free and for families making less than $125,000. You will not get a tuition bill from a public college or university if the plan that I worked on with Bernie Sanders uh, is enacted. And we're going to work hard to make sure that it is because we are going to go where the money is. Most of the gains in the last years since the Great Recession have gone to the very top. So we are going to have the wealthy pay their fair share. We're going to have corporations uh, make a contribution greater than they are now to our country. That is a plan that has been analyzed by independent experts, which said that it could produce 10 million new jobs. By contrast, Donald's plan has been uh, analyzed to uh, conclude it might lose uh, three and a half million jobs. Why? Because his whole plan is to cut taxes, to give the biggest tax breaks ever to the wealthy and to corporations, adding $20 trillion to our debt and causing the kind of dislocation that we have seen before, because it truly will be trickle-down economics on steroids. So the plan I have, I think, will actually produce greater opportunities. The plan he has will cost us jobs and possibly lead to another great recession. Secretary, thank you. Mr. Trump, why will your plan create more jobs and growth than Secretary Clinton? Well, first of all, before I start on my plan, her plan is going to raise taxes and even double your taxes. Her tax plan is a disaster. And she can say all she wants about college tuition. And I'm a big proponent. We're going to do a lot of things for college tuition. But the rest of the public is going to be paying for it. We will have a massive, massive tax increase under Hillary Clinton's plan. But I'd like to start off where we left. Because when I said Japan and Germany, and I'm not to single them out, but South Korea, these are very rich, powerful countries. Uh, Saudi Arabia, nothing but money. We protect Saudi Arabia. Why aren't they paying? She immediately, when she heard this, I questioned it. And I questioned NATO. Why aren't the NATO questioned? Why aren't they paying? Because they weren't paying. Since I did this, this was a year ago, all of a sudden they're paying. And I've been given a lot, of, a lot of credit for it. All of a sudden they're starting to pay up. They have to pay up. We're protecting people. They have to pay up. And I'm a big fan of NATO, but they have to pay up. She comes out and said, we love our allies. We think our allies are great. Well, it's awfully hard to get them to pay up when you have somebody saying, we think how great they are. We have to tell Japan in a very nice way. We have to tell Germany, all of these countries, South Korea. We have to say, you have to help us out. We have, during his regime, during President Obama's regime, we've doubled our national debt. We're up to $20 trillion. So my plan, we're going to renegotiate trade deals. We're going to have a lot of free trade. We're going to have free trade, more free trade than we have right now. But we have horrible deals. Our jobs are being taken out by the deal that her husband signed, NAFTA, one of the worst deals ever. Her, our jobs are being sucked out of our economy. You look at all of the places that I just left. You go to Pennsylvania, you go to Ohio, you go to Florida, you go to any of them. You go upstate New York. Our jobs have fled to Mexico and other places. We're bringing our jobs back. I am going to renegotiate NAFTA. And if I can't make a great deal, then we're going to terminate NAFTA and we're going to create new deals. We're going to have trade. But we're going to, term we're going to terminate it. We're going to make a great trade deal. And if we can't, we're going to do it. We're going to go a separate way because it has been a disaster. We are going to cut taxes massively. We're going to cut business taxes massively. They're going to start hiring people. We're going to bring the two and a half trillion dollars that's offshore fine. back into the country. We are going to start the Mr. engine rolling again because right now Mr. our Trump. country is dying at 1% GDP. Well, let me translate that if I can, Chris, because um, you can't. the fact is he's going to uh, 
advocate for the largest tax cuts we've ever seen, three times more than uh, the tax cuts under the Bush administration. I have said repeatedly throughout this campaign, I will not raise taxes on anyone making $250,000 or less. I also will not add a penny to the debt. I have costed out what I'm going to do. He will, through his massive tax cuts, add $20 trillion to the debt. Well, he mentioned the debt. We know how to get control of the debt. When my husband was president, we went from a $300 billion deficit to a $200 billion surplus, and we were actually on the path to eliminating the national debt. When President Obama came into office, he inherited the worst economic disaster since the Great Depression. He has cut the deficit by two-thirds. So, yes, one of the ways you go after the debt, one of the ways you create jobs is by investing in people. So I do have investments, investments in new jobs, investments in education, skill training, and the opportunities for people to get ahead and stay ahead. That's the kind of approach Secretary. that will work. Cutting taxes on the wealthy, we've tried that. Secretary. It has not worked the way that uh, it has been Secretary promised. Secretary Clinton, I want, I want to pursue your plan uh, because in many ways, it is similar to the Obama stimulus plan in 2009, uh, which has led to the slowest GDP growth since 1949. Correct. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, you told me in July when we spoke that the problem is that President Obama didn't get to do enough in what he was trying to do with the stimulus. So is your plan basically more, even more of the Obama stimulus? Well, it's a combination, Chris, and let, let me say that when you inherit the level of economic catastrophe that President Obama inherited, uh, it was a real touch-and-go situation. I was in the Senate before I became Secretary of State. I've never seen uh, people as physically distraught as the Bush administration uh, team was because of what was happening to the economy. I personally believe that the steps that President Obama took saved the economy. He doesn't get the credit he deserves for taking some very hard positions. But it was a terrible recession. So now we've dug ourselves out of it. We're standing, but we're not yet running. So what I am proposing is that we invest from the middle out and the ground up, not the top down. That is not going to work. That's why what I have put forward doesn't add a penny to the debt, but it is the kind of approach that will enable more people to take those new jobs, higher paying jobs. We're beginning to see some increase in incomes, and we certainly have had a long string me, of increasing jobs. We've got to do more to get the whole economy moving, and that's what I believe I will be able to do. Mr. Trump, even conservative economists who have looked at your plan say that the numbers don't add up, that your idea, and you've talked about 25 million jobs created, 4% over a 10 year period growth is unrealistic. Uh, and they say, you talk a lot about growing the energy industry, they say with oil prices as low as they are right now, that's unrealistic as well. Your response. Sir. So I just left some high representatives of India. They're growing at 8%. Uh, China is growing at 7%, and that for them is a catastrophically no low number. We are growing, our last report came out, and it's right around the 1% level, and I think it's going down. Last week, as you know, la at the end of last week, they came out with an anemic jobs report, a terrible jobs report. In fact, I said, is that the last jobs report before the election? Because if it is, I should win easily. It was so bad. The report was so bad. Look, our country is stagnant. We've lost our jobs. We've lost our businesses. We're not making things anymore, relatively speaking. Our product is pouring in from China, pouring in from Vietnam, pouring in from all over the world. I've visited so many communities. This has been such an incredible education for me, Chris. I've gotten to know so many. I've developed so many friends over the last year. And they cry when they see what's happened. I passed factories that were thriving 20, 25 years ago. And because of the bill that her husband signed and she blessed 100%, it is just horrible what's happened to these people in these communities. Now, she can say that her husband did well, but boy, did they suffer as NAFTA kicked in, because it didn't really kick in very much, but it kicked in after they left. Boy, did they suffer. 
That was one of the worst things that's ever been signed by our country. Now she wants to sign Trans-Pacific Partnership, and she wants it. She lied when she said she didn't call it the gold standard in one of the debates. She totally lied. She did call it the gold standard, and they actually fact-checked, and they said I was right. I was so I, I, I want to give you a chance to, to briefly speak to that, and then I want to pivot to one-sixth of the will economy, be as bad as now. which is Obamacare. But go ahead, well, briefly. First, let me, let me say, number one, uh, when I saw the uh, final agreement for TPP, I said I was against it. It didn't meet my tests. I've had the same tests. Does it create jobs, raise incomes, and further our national security? I'm against it now. I'll be against it after the election. I'll be against it when I'm president. There's only one of us on this stage who's actually shipped jobs to Mexico, because that's Donald. He's shipped jobs to 12 countries, including Mexico. But he mentioned China. And, you know, one of the biggest problems we have with China is the illegal dumping of steel and aluminum into our markets. I have fought against that as a senator. I've stood up against it as Secretary of State. Donald has bought Chinese steel and aluminum. In fact, the Trump hotel right here in Las Vegas was made with Chinese steel. So he goes around with crocodile tears about how terrible it is. But he has given That's jobs to Chinese steel workers, not American steel Mr. workers. Trump? That's the kind well, of approach well, just say, that is just, just not going to work. It We're just... going to pull the country together. We're going to have trade agreements that we enforce. That's why I'm going to have a trade prosecutor for the first time in history. And we're going to enforce those agreements. And we're going to look for businesses uh, to help Clinton. us by buying American products. Ahead, I ask Trump. a simple question. She's been doing this for 30 years. Why the hell didn't you do it over the last 15, 20 years? You, you were know, very much involved. Excuse me. My turn. You were very much involved in every aspect of this country. Very much. And you do have experience. I say the one thing you have over me is experience, but it's bad experience because what you've done has turned out badly. For 30 years, you've been in a position to help. And if you say that I use steel or I use something else, I make it impossible for me to do that. I wouldn't mind. The problem is you talk, but you don't get anything done, Hillary. You don't. Just like when you ran the State Department, $6 billion was missing. How do you miss $6 billion? You ran the State Department. Six billion dollars was either stolen, they don't know, it's gone. Six billion dollars. If you become president, this country is going to be in some mess, believe me. Well, first of all, what he just said about the State Department is not only untrue, it's been debunked numerous times, uh, but I think it's really an important issue. He raised the 30 years of experience. So let me just talk briefly about that. You know, Back in the 1970s, I worked for the Children's Defense Fund, and I was taking on uh, discrimination against African-American kids in schools. He was getting sued by the Justice Department for racial discrimination in his apartment buildings. In the 1980s, I was working to reform the schools in Arkansas. He was borrowing $14 million from his father to start his businesses. In the 1990s, I went to Beijing, and I said, women's rights are human rights. He insulted a former Miss Universe, Alicia Machado, called her a, an eating machine. And a on the day when I was in the Situation Room monitoring the raid that brought Osama bin Laden to justice, he was hosting The Celebrity Apprentice. So I'm happy to compare my 30 years of experience, what I've done for this country, trying to help in every way I could, especially kids and families, get ahead and stay ahead with your 30 years, and I'll let the American people make that decision. Well, I think I did a much better job. I built a massive company, a great company, some of the greatest assets in the, in the, anywhere in the world, uh, worth many, many billions of dollars. Uh, I started with a $1 million loan. I agree with that. It's a $1 million loan, but I built a phenomenal company. And if we could run our country the way I've run my company, we would have a country that you would be so proud of. You would even be proud of it. And frankly, uh, when you look at her real record, Take a look at Syria. Take a look at the migration. Take a look at Libya. Take a look at Iraq. She gave us ISIS because her and Obama created this huge vacuum. And a small group came out of that huge vacuum because when they we should have never been in Iraq, but once we were there, we should have never got out the way they wanted to get out. She gave us ISIS as sure as you are sitting there. And what happened is now ISIS is in 32 countries. And now I listen how she's going to get rid of ISIS. She's going to get rid of nobody. All right. We're, we are going to get to foreign hotspots in a few moments, but the next segment is fitness to be president of the United States. Mr. Trump, at the last debate, 
You said your talk about grabbing women was just that, talk, and that you'd never actually done it. And since then, as we all know, nine women have come forward and said that you either groped them or kissed them without their consent. Why would so many different women from so many different circumstances over so many different years, why would they all in this last couple of weeks make up, you deny this, why would they all make up these stories? And since this is a question for both of you, Secretary Clinton, Mr. Trump says what your husband did and that you defended was even worse. Mr. Trump, you go first. Well, first of all, those stories have been largely debunked. Uh, those people, I don't know those people. I have a feeling how they came. I believe it was her campaign that did it. Just like if you look at what came out today on the clips where I was wondering what happened with my rally in Chicago and other rallies where we had such violence. She's the one in Obama that caused the violence. They hired people, they paid them $1,500, and they're on tape saying, be violent, cause fights, do bad things. I would say the only way, because those stories are all totally false, I have to say that. And I didn't even apologize to my wife, who's sitting right here, because I didn't do anything. I didn't know any of these women. I didn't see these women. These women, the woman on the plane, the woman, I think they want either fame or her campaign did it. And I think it's her campaign. Because what I saw, what they did, which is a criminal act, by the way, where they're telling people to go out and start fistfights and start violence. And I'll tell you what, in particular in Chicago, people were hurt and people could have been killed in that riot. And that was now all on tape, started by her. I believe, Chris, that she got these people to step forward. If it wasn't, they get their 10 minutes of fame. But they were all totally, it was all fiction. It was lies and it was fiction. Well, Secretary Clinton. At, at the last debate, we heard Donald talking about what he uh, did to women. And after that, a number of women have come forward. Uh, saying that's exactly what he did to them. Now, what was his response? Well, he held a number of big rallies where he said that he could not possibly have done uh, those things to those women because they were not attractive enough for I, I did uh, not them say to that. be assaulted. I did not say that. In fact, he went on but to say... Her two, her two minutes, sir, her two minutes. But he, did he, not it, say that. It's her two minutes. He, he went on to say, uh, look at her. I don't think so about another woman. He said, that wouldn't be my first choice. He attacked the woman reporter writing the story, called her disgusting, as he has called a number of women uh, during this campaign. You know, Donald thinks belittling women makes him bigger. He goes after their dignity, their self-worth, and I don't think there is a woman anywhere who doesn't know what that feels like. So we now know what Donald thinks and what he says and how he acts toward women. That's who Donald is. I think it's really up to all of us to demonstrate who we are and who our country is and to stand up and be very clear about what we expect from our next president, how we want to bring our country together, where we don't want to have the kind of pitting of people one against the other, where instead we celebrate our diversity, we lift people up, and we make our country even greater. America is great because America is good. And it really is up to all of us to make that true now and in the future, and particularly for our children and our grandchildren. Mr. Trump. Nobody has more respect for women than I do. Nobody. Nobody has more respect. Please, everybody. And frankly, uh, those stories have been largely debunked. And I really want to just talk about something slightly different. She mentions this, which is all fiction, all fictionalized, probably or possibly started by her and her very sleazy campaign. But I will tell you, what isn't fictionalized are her emails, where she destroyed 33,000 emails criminally, criminally, after getting a subpoena from the United States con Congress. What happened to the FBI? I don't know. We have a great general, four-star general, today, you read it in all the papers, 
going to potentially serve five years in jail for lying to the FBI. One lie. She's lied hundreds of times to the people, to Congress, and to the, to the FBI. He's going to probably go to jail. This is a four-star general. And she gets away with it, and she can run for the presidency of the United States? That's really what you should be talking about, not fiction, where somebody wants fame or where they come out of her crooked campaign. Secretary Clinton. Well, every time uh, Donald is pushed on something, which is obviously uncomfortable, like what these women are saying, um, he immediately goes to uh, denying responsibility. Uh, and it's not just about women. He never apologizes or says he's sorry for anything. So we know what he has said and what he's done to women. But he also went after a disabled reporter, mocked and mimicked him on Wrong. national television. He went after Mr. and Mrs. Khan, the parents of a young man who died serving our country, a gold star family because of their religion. He went after John McCain, a prisoner of war, said he prefers people who aren't captured. He went after a federal judge born in Indiana, but who Donald said couldn't be trusted to try the fraud and racketeering case against Trump University because his parents were Mexican. So it's not one thing. This is a pattern, a pattern of divisiveness, of a very dark and in many ways, dangerous vision of our country, where he incites violence, where he applauds people who are pushing and pulling and punching at his rallies. That is not who America is. And I hope that no. as we move in the last no. weeks of this campaign, more and more people will understand what's at stake in this election. It really does come down to what kind of country we are going to have. So sad when she talks about violence, at my rallies, and she caused the violence. Uh, it's on tape. The, during now, the, last the other things are false, but honestly, I'd love to talk about getting rid of ISIS, and I'd love to talk about other things. Okay. But those other charges, as she knows, there, are false. In this, in this bucket about fitness to be president, there's been a lot of developments over the last 10 days since the last debate. I'd like to ask you about, about them. These are questions that the American people have. Secretary Clinton, during your 2009 Senate confirmation hearing, you promised to avoid even the appearance of a conflict of interest with your dealing with the Clinton Foundation while you were Secretary of State. But emails show that donors got special access to you. Those seeking grants for Haiti relief were considered separately from non-donors, and some of those donors got contract, government contracts, taxpayer money, can you really say that you kept your pledge to that Senate committee? And why isn't what happened and what went on between you and the Clinton Foundation, why isn't it what Mr. Trump calls pay to play? Well, everything I did as Secretary of State was in furtherance of uh, uh, our country's interests and our values. The State Department has said that. I think that's been proven. But I am happy. In fact, I am thrilled to talk about the Clinton Foundation because it is a world-renowned charity. And I am so proud of the work that it does. You know, I could talk for the rest of the debate. I know I don't have the time to do that. But just briefly, uh, the Clinton Foundation made it possible for 11 million people around the world with HIV AIDS to afford treatment. And that's about half of all the people in the world who are getting treatment. In partnership with the American uh, Health Association, we have made environments and schools healthier Sec for kids, Secretary including Clinton, healthier respect, lunches. Respectfully, this is, a, this is an open discussion. Well, it is an open I, discussion. I understand. And, and a specific you, question went to pay for play. Do you want to well, talk about that? Well, no, think, look, but there is no evidence, but there well, is, there is, there is a lot of evidence it's been very about well the very good work and, it's a and the high enterprise that the and so many people like know Clinton Trump's Foundation have It's a criminal enterprise. Uh, Saudi Arabia giving $25 million, Qatar, all of these countries. You talk about women and women's rights. So these are people that push gays off business, off buildings. These are people that kill women and treat women horribly, and yet you take their money. So I'd like to ask you right now, why don't you give back the money that you've taken from certain countries that treat certain groups of people so horribly. Why don't you give back the money? I think it would be a great gesture. Well, because she takes a tremendous amount of money 
And you take a look at the people of Haiti. I was in little Haiti the other day in Florida, and I want to tell you, they hate the Clintons because what's happened in Haiti with the Clinton Foundation is a disgrace. And you know it, and they know it, and everybody knows Secretary it. Secretary Clinton. Well, very quickly, we um, at the Clinton Foundation spend 90 percent, 90 percent of all the money that uh, is donated on behalf of programs of people around the world and in our own country. I'm very proud of that. We have the highest rating from the watchdogs that uh, follow foundations. And I'd be happy to compare what we do with the Trump Foundation, which took money from other people and bought a six-foot portrait of Donald. I mean, who does that? Uh, it, it just was astonishing. But when it comes to Haiti, Haiti is the poorest country in our hemisphere. The earthquake and the hurricanes, it has devastated Haiti. Uh, Bill and I have been involved in trying to help Haiti for many years. The Clinton Foundation raised $30 million to help Haiti after the catastrophic uh, earthquake and all of the terrible problems the people there had. We've done things to help small businesses, agriculture, and so much else. And we're going to keep working to all help right. Haiti because it's an important I, part of the American I, I wanna, uh, They don't experience. want you to help them anymore. I'd like to mention one thing. Trump Foundation, small foundation. People contribute. I contribute. The money goes 100 percent. 100 percent goes to different charities, including a lot of military. I don't get anything. I don't buy boats. I don't buy planes. What happens wasn't, is the wasn't money goes the money, Wasn't some of the money used to settle your lawsuit, sir? No, it was, we put up the American flag, and that's it. They put up the American flag. We fought for the right in Palm Beach right, to put up the American there was a, flag. There was a penalty that was imposed by Palm Beach County, there and the was, money came there was, from your foundation. And by the way, the money, the money yourself, went sir. to Fisher House, where they build houses. The money that you're talking about went to Fisher House, where they build houses for veterans and disabled I, I want to get into one but last... But, of course, there's no way we can know whether any of that is true because he hasn't released his tax returns. He is the first candidate ever to run for president in the last 40-plus years who has not released his tax returns. So everything he says about charity or anything else, uh, we can't uh, prove it. You can look at our tax returns. We've got them all out there. But what is really troubling... Uh, is that we learned in the last debate he has not paid a penny in federal income tax. And we were talking about immigrants a few minutes ago, Chris. You know, half of all immigrants, undocumented immigrants in our country, actually pay federal income tax. So we have undocumented immigrants in America who are paying more federal income tax than a billionaire. I, want I find so that let me just, just tell you very astonishing. Simply. We're entitled, because of the laws that people like her pass, to take massive amounts of depreciation and other charges, and we do it. And all of her donors, just about all of them, I know Buffett took hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, Soros, George Soros, took hundreds we, of millions we, of dollars. Let me just explain. We, we, All no, of her we, donors, we most of her donors Mr. Trump, have done the same thing we, as I did. Okay. We, and you know what you we, should have done? Folks, we heard and this you know, is, Hillary, what you should have done? You should have changed the law when you were a United States senator. Folks, you don't like we heard it. this. Yeah. Because your donors and your special interests are doing the same thing as I do, except even more so. Well, you, you should know, have changed the law, but you won't change I, the law because you take in so much money. I mean, I sat in my apartment today on a very beautiful hotel down the street, known as Trump. Made with Chinese steel. But I will tell you, I sat there, I sat there watching ad after ad after ad, false ad, all paid for by your friends on Wall Street that gave so much money because they know you're going to protect them. And frankly, uh, you should have changed Mr. the laws. Trump, if you don't like what I did, you should have changed the laws. Mr. Trump, I want to ask you about one last question in, the, in this topic. You have been warning at re rallies recently that this election is rigged and that Hillary Clinton is in the process of trying to steal it from you. Your running mate, Governor Pence, pledged on Sunday that he and you, his words, will absolutely accept the result of this election. Today, your daughter Ivanka said the same thing. I want to ask you here on the stage tonight, do you make the same commitment that you will absolutely, sir, that you will absolutely accept the result of this election? I will look at it at the time. I'm not looking at anything now. I'll look at it at the time. What I've seen, what I've seen is so bad. First of all, the media is so dishonest and so corrupt, and the pile-on is so amazing. The New York Times actually wrote an article about it that they don't even care. It's so dishonest, and they've poisoned the minds of the voters. But unfortunately for them, 
I think the voters are seeing through it. I think they're going to see through it. We'll find out on November 8th, but I think they're going but, to see but, through but it. But, sir, there's if a... If you look, excuse me, Chris, if you look at your voter rolls, you will see millions of people that are registered to vote. Millions. This isn't coming from me. This is coming from Pew Report and other places. Millions of people that are registered to vote <clears throat> that shouldn't be registered to vote. So... Let me just give you one other thing. So I talk about the corrupt media. I talk about the millions of people. I'll tell you one other thing. She shouldn't be allowed to run. It's cro it, she's, she's guilty of a very, very serious crime. She should not be allowed to run. And just in that respect, I say it's rigged. Because she but, should but never, Chris, she should never have been allowed to run for the presidency based on what she did with emails and so many other but, things. But, sir, there is a tradition in this country, in fact, one of the prides of this country, is the peaceful transition of power and that no matter how hard fought a campaign is, that at the end of the campaign, that the loser concedes to the winner, not saying that you're necessarily going to be the loser or the winner, but that the loser concedes to the winner and that the country comes together in part for the good of the country. Are you saying you're not prepared now to commit to that principle. What I'm saying is that I will tell you at the time. I'll keep you in suspense. Well, okay? Chris, let me respond to that because that's horrifying. You know, every time Donald thinks things are not going in his direction, he claims whatever it is is rigged against him. Uh, the FBI conducted a year-long investigation into my emails. They concluded there was no case. He said the FBI was rigged. He lost the Iowa caucus. He lost the Wisconsin primary. He said the Republican primary was rigged against him. Then Trump University gets sued for fraud and racketeering. He claims the court system and the federal judge is rigged against him. Uh, there was even a time when he didn't get an Emmy for his TV program three years in a row, and he started tweeting that the Emmys were rigged against Should've him. Should have gotten it. This, <laughs> this is a mindset. This is, this is how Donald thinks. And it's funny, but it's also really troubling. Okay. Now, that is not the way our democracy works. We've been around for 240 years. We've had free and fair elections. We've accepted the outcomes when we may not have liked them. And that is what must be expected of anyone standing on a debate stage during a general election. You know, President Obama said the other day, when you're whining before hold, hold, the game is folks. even hold on, finished, folks. it just shows... You, you're not up to doing the job. And let's, you know, let's be clear about what he is saying and what that means. He is denigrating, he's talking down our democracy. And I, for one, am appalled that somebody who is the nominee of one of our two major parties would take that kind of position. I think what the FBI did and what the Department of Justice did, including meeting with her husband, the Attorney General, in the back of an airplane on the tarmac in Arizona, I think it's disgraceful. I think it's a disgrace. All right. I think we've never had a situation uh, uh, hold, so bad. Hold on, in this folks. This, this doesn't do any good for anyone. Let's please continue the debate and let's move on to the subject of foreign hotspots. The Iraqi offensive to take back Mosul has begun. If they are successful in pushing ISIS out of that city and out of all of Iraq, the question then becomes. What happens the day after? And that's something that whichever of you ends up, whoever of you ends up as president is going to have to confront. Will you put U.S. troops into that vacuum to make sure that ISIS doesn't come back or isn't replaced by something even worse? Secretary Clinton, you go first in this segment. You have two minutes. Well, I am encouraged that uh, there is an effort led by the Iraqi army, uh, supported by Kurdish forces and uh, also, given the help and advice from the number of special forces and other Americans on the ground, but I will not support putting American soldiers into Iraq as an occupying force. I don't think that is in our interests, and I don't think that would be smart to do. In fact, Chris, I think that would be a big red flag waving for ISIS to reconstitute itself. The goal here is to take back Mosul. It's going to be a hard fight. I've got no... Uh, illusions about that, and then continue to press into Syria to begin to take back and move on Raqqa, which is the ISIS headquarters. I am hopeful that the hard work that American uh, military advisors have done will pay off and that we will see 
uh, a, real, a really successful military operation. But we know we've got lots of work to do. Syria will remain a hotbed of terrorism as long as the civil war, aided and abetted by the Iranians and the Russians, continue. So I have said, look, we need to keep our eye on ISIS. That's why I want to have an intelligence surge that protects us here at home, why we have to go after them from the air, on the ground, online, why we have to make sure here at home we don't let terrorists buy weapons. If you're too dangerous to fly, you're too dangerous to buy a gun. And I'm going to continue to uh, push for a no-fly zone and safe havens within Syria, not only to help protect the Syrians and prevent the constant outflow of refugees, but to frankly gain some leverage on both the Syrian government and the Russians so that perhaps we can have uh, the kind of serious negotiation necessary to bring the conflict to an end and go forward on a political track. Mr. Trump, same question. If we are able to push ISIS out of Mosul and out of Iraq, will, would you be willing to put U.S. troops in there to prevent their return or something else? Let me tell you, Mosul's so sad. We had Mosul. But when she left, when she took everybody out, we lost Mosul. Now we're fighting again to get Mosul. The problem with Mosul and what they wanted to do is they wanted to get the leaders of ISIS who they felt were in Mosul. About three months ago, I started reading that they want to get the leaders, and they're, go they're going to attack Mosul. Whatever happened to the element of surprise, okay? We announced we're going after Mosul. I've been reading about going after Mosul now for about, how long is it, Hillary? Three months? These people have all left. They've all left. The element of surprise. Douglas, MacArthur, George Patton, spinning in their graves when they see the stupidity of our country. So we're now fighting for Mosul that we had. All she had to do was stay there. Now we're going in to get it. But you know who the big winner in Mosul is going to be after we eventually get it? And the only reason they did it is because she's running for the office of president. And they want to look tough. They want to look good. He violated the red line in the sand. And he made so many mistakes, made all mistakes. That's why we have the great migration. But she wanted to look good for the election. So they're going in. But who's going to get Mosul, really? We'll take Mosul eventually. By the way, if you look at what's happening, much tougher than they thought. Much, much tougher, much more dangerous, going to be more deaths than they thought. But the leaders that we wanted to get are all gone because they're smart. They say, what do we need this for? So Mosul is going to be a wonderful thing, and Iran should write us a letter of thank you, just like the really stupid, the stupidest deal of all time, a deal that's going to give Iran absolutely nuclear weapons. Iran should write us yet another letter saying thank you very much. Because Iran, as I said many years ago, Iran is taking over Iraq, something they've wanted to do forever, but we've made it so easy for them. So we're now going to take Mosul, and you know who's going to be the beneficiary? Iran. Boy, are they making, I mean, they are outsmarting. I, look, you're not there. You might be involved in that decision, but you were there when you took everybody out of Mosul and out of Iraq. You shouldn't have been in Iraq, but you did vote for it. You shouldn't have been in Iraq, but once you were in Iraq, you should have Sir, never left the way. The point is, the two big winner right. is going to be Iran. Well, you know, once again, uh, Donald is implying that he didn't support the invasion of Iraq. I said it was a mistake. I've said that years ago. He has consistently denied what is Wrong. a very clear fact that Wrong. before the invasion, he supported it. And, you know, I just want everybody to go Google it. Google Donald Trump Iraq, and you will see the dozens of sources which verify that he was for the invasion of Iraq. Wrong. And you can actually hear the audio of him saying that. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters because he has not told the truth about that position. I guess he believes it makes him look better now to contrast with me because uh, I did vote for it. But what's really important here is to understand all the interplay. Mosul is a Sunni city. Mosul is on the border of Syria. And yes, we do need to go after Baghdadi, and uh, just like we went after uh, bin Laden. Uh, while you were doing Celebrity Apprentice, and we brought him to justice. We need to go after the leadership, but we need to get rid of them, get rid of their fighters. There are estimated several thousand fighters in Mosul. They've been digging underground. They've been prepared to defend. It's going to be tough fighting, 
but I think we can take back Mosul and then we can move on into Syria and take back Raqqa. This is what we have to do. I'm, I'm just am amazed that he seems to think that the Iraqi government and our allies and everybody else launched uh, the attack on Mosul to help me in this election, but that's how Donald thinks, you know? He always Let is me, looking for some Chris, conspiracy. we don't gain anything. He has all the Iran is taking over Iraq. Secretary Clinton. And Iran is taking over Iraq. We don't gain anything. Secretary Clinton. We would have gained if they did it by surprise. Wait, 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 wait. Time. Secretary Clinton, and it's an open he, discussion. He, but he Secretary, says we would have gained if they did it by surprise. Secretary, please let Mr. Trump's face. He's unfit, and he proves it every time You are the one that's unfit. You know, WikiLeaks just actually came out. John Podesta said some horrible things about you. And boy, was he right. He said some beauties. And you know, Bernie Sanders, uh, he said you have bad judgment. You do. And if you think that going into Mosul, after we let the world know we're going in, and all of the people that we really wanted, the leaders, they're all gone. If you think that was good, then you do. Now, John Podesta said you have terrible instincts. Bernie Sanders said you have bad judgment. I agree with both. Well, you should ask Bernie Sanders who he's supporting for president. And he has said, Which is as a he big has mistake. campaigned for me around the country, you are the most dangerous person to run for president in the modern history of America. I think he's right. Let's turn to Aleppo. <laughs> Mr. Trump, in the last debate, you were both asked about the situation in the Syrian city of Aleppo. And I want to follow up on that because you said several things in that debate which were not true, sir. You said that Aleppo has basically fallen. In fact, there, in fact, there are... It's a, it's a catastrophe. I it mean, is a catastrophe, a but there, there are a quarter of... Have you of seen it? Have you seen it? Sir... Have you seen what's happened sir, to Aleppo? If, if I might finish my question... Okay, so it hasn't fallen. Take a look at it. Well, there are a quarter of a million people still living there and being slaughtered. That's right. You and, also and said... And they are being slaughtered. Yes. Because of bad decisions. At, if I may just finish here. And you also said that, ISIS, that Syria and Russia are busy fighting ISIS. In fact, they have been the ones who've been bombing and shelling eastern Aleppo, uh, and they just announced a humanitarian pause, in effect admitting that they have been bombing and shelling Aleppo. Would you like to clear that up, sir? Well, uh, Aleppo is a disaster. It's a humanitarian nightmare, but it has fallen from, the sta from any standpoint. I mean, what do you need, a signed document? Take a look at Aleppo. It is so sad when you see what's happened. And a lot of this is because of Hillary Clinton. Because what's happened is by fighting Assad, who turned out to be a lot tougher than she thought, and now she's going to say, oh, he loves Assad. She's just, he's just much tougher and much smarter than her and Obama. And everyone thought he was gone two years ago, three years ago. He aligned, he aligned with Russia. He now also aligned with Iran who we made very powerful. We gave them $150 billion back. We give them $1.7 billion in cash. I mean cash, bundles of cash as big as this stage. We gave them $1.7 billion. Now, they have lined, he has aligned with Russia and with Iran. They don't want ISIS, but they have other things because we're backing, we're backing rebels. We don't know who the rebels are. We're giving them Lots of money, lots of everything. We don't know who the rebels are. And when and if, and it's not going to happen because you have Russia and you have Iran now, but if they ever did overthrow Assad, you might end up with as bad as Assad is. And he's a bad guy. But you may very well end up with worse than Assad. If she did nothing, we'd be in much better shape. And this is what's caused the Great Migration, where she's taken in tens of thousands of Syrian refugees who probably, in many cases, not probably, who are definitely, me, in many cases, ISIS aligned, and we now have them in our country, and wait till you see, this is going to be the great Trojan horse, and wait till you see what happens in the coming years. Lots of luck, Hillary. Thanks a lot for doing a great job. Secretary Clinton, you have talked about, and in the last debate, and again today, that you would impose a no-fly zone to try to protect the people of Aleppo and to stop the killing there. President Obama has refused to do that because he fears it's going to draw us closer or deeper into the conflict. And General Joseph Dunford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, says, you impose a no-fly zone, chances are you're going to get into a war, his words, with Syria and, and Russia. 
So the question I have is, if you impose a no-fly zone, first of all, how do you respond to their concerns? Secondly, if you impose a no-fly zone and a Russian plane violates that, does President Clinton shoot that plane down? Well, Chris, first of all, I think a no-fly zone could save lives and could hasten the end of the conflict. I am well aware of the really legitimate concerns that you have expressed from both the president and the general. Uh, this would not be done just on the first day. This would take a lot of negotiation. It would also take making it clear to the Russians and the Syrians that our purpose here was to provide safe zones on the ground. We've had millions of people leave Syria, and those millions of people uh, inside Syria who've been dislocated. So I think we could strike a deal and make it very clear uh, to the Russians and the Syrians that this was something that we believe was in the best interests of the people on the ground in Syria. It would help us with our fight against ISIS. But I want to respond to what Donald said about refugees. He's made these claims repeatedly. I am not going to let anyone into this country who is not vetted, who we do not have confidence in, but I am not going to slam the door on women and children. I, that picture of that little four-year-old boy in Aleppo with the blood coming down his face while he sat in an ambulance is haunting. And so we are going to do very careful, thorough vetting. That does not solve our internal challenges with ISIS and our need to stop radicalization, to work with American Muslim communities who are on the front lines to identify and prevent attacks. In fact, the killer of the dozens of people at the nightclub in Orlando, the Pulse nightclub, was born in Queens, the same place Donald was born. So let's be clear about what the threat is and how we are best going to be able to meet it. And yes, some of that threat emanates from over in Syria and Iraq, and we've got to keep fighting, and I will defeat ISIS, and some of it is we have to up our game and be much smarter here Folks, at home. I want to get into our final segment. But, but I just have to, it's, it's so quick. ridiculous what you, she will defeat ISIS. We should have never let ISIS happen in the first place. And right now they're in 32 countries. Okay. You should have never, wait one second. They had a ceasefire three weeks ago. A ceasefire, United States, Russia, Syria. And during the ceasefire, Russia took over vast swatches of land. And then they said, we don't want the ceasefire anymore. We are so outplayed on missiles, on ceasefires. They are outplayed. Now, she wasn't there. I assume she had nothing to do with it. But our country is so outplayed by okay. Putin and Assad and, uh, by the way, and by Iran. Nobody can believe how stupid our leadership is. Mr. Well, Trump, Secretary Clinton, no, I, we need to move on to our final segment, and that is the national debt, which has not been discussed until tonight. Our national debt as a share of the economy, our GDP, is now 77 percent. That's the highest since just after World War II. But the nonpartisan committee for a responsible federal budget says, Secretary Clinton, under your plan, debt would rise to 86 percent of GDP over the next 10 years. Mr. Trump, under your plan, they say it would rise to 105 percent of GDP over the next 10 years. Question is, why are both of you ignoring this problem? Mr. Trump, you go first. Well, I say they're wrong because I'm going to create tremendous jobs. And we're bringing GDP from really 1%, which is what it is now. And if she got in, it'll be less than zero. Uh, but we're bringing it from 1% up to 4%. And I actually think we can go higher than 4%. I think you can go to 5 or 6%. And if we do, you don't have to bother asking your question because we have a tremendous machine. We will have created a tre tremendous economic machine once again. To do that, we're taking back jobs. We're not going to let our companies be raided by other countries where we lose all our jobs. We don't make our product anymore. It's very sad. But I'm going to create a the kind of a country that we were from the standpoint of industry. We used to be there. We've given it up. We've become very, very sloppy. We've had people that are political hacks making the biggest deals in the world, bigger than companies. You take these big companies, these trade deals are far bigger than these companies. And yet we don't use our great leaders, many of whom back me and many of whom back Hillary, I must say. But we don't use those people. Those are the people, these are the greatest negotiators in the world. We have the greatest business people in the world. We have to use them to negotiate our trade deals. We use political hacks. We use people that get the position because they gave, they made a campaign contribution. 
and they're dealing with China and people that are very much smarter than they are. So we have to use our great people. But with that being said, we will create an economic machine, the likes of which we haven't seen in many decades. And people, Chris, will again go back to work, and they'll make a lot of money, and we'll have companies that will grow and expand and start from new. Secretary Clinton. Well, first, when I, when I hear Donald talk like that and know that his slogan is Make America Great Again, I wonder when he thought America was great. Uh, and before uh, he uh, rushes and says, you know, before you and President Obama were there, I think it's important to recognize that he has been criticizing um, our government for decades. You know, back in 1987, he took out a $100,000 ad in the New York Times during the time when President Reagan was president and basically said exactly what he just said now, that we were the laughing stock of the world. He was criticizing President Reagan. This is the way Donald thinks about himself, puts himself into you know, the middle and says, you know, I alone can fix it, as he said on the convention stage. But if you look at the debt, which is the issue you asked about, Chris, I pay for everything I'm proposing. I do not add a penny to the national debt. I take that very seriously because I do think it's one of the issues we've got to come to grips with. So when I talk about how we're going to pay for education, how we're going to invest in infrastructure, how we're going to get the cost of prescription drugs down, and a lot of the other issues that people talk to me about all the time, I've made it very clear, we are going where the money is. We are going to ask the wealthy and corporations to pay their fair share. And there is no evidence whatsoever that that will slow down or diminish our growth. In fact, I think just the opposite. We'll have what economists call middle-out growth. We've got to get back to rebuilding the middle class, the families of America. That's where growth will come from. That's why I want to invest in you. I want to invest in your family. And I think that's the smartest way to grow the economy, to make the economy fairer. And we just have a big disagreement about this. It may be because of our experiences. You know, he started off with okay. his dad as a millionaire. I, uh, I started off heard, with my dad as a before, small Hillary. businessman. We've heard and this before. I think it's, Secretary you know, Clinton. it's a difference that affects how we see the world and what we want to do with the economy. T time. Thank you, Hillary. I, Could I just respond? Well, no. Well, no because sir, I because did we're disagree with Ronald Reagan very strongly on trade. I disagreed with him. We should have been much tougher on trade even then. I've been waiting for years. Nobody okay. does it right. And frankly, now we're going to do it right. All right. I, the one last area I want to get into with you in this debate is the fact that the biggest driver of our debt is entitlements, which is 60% of all federal spending. Now, the Committee for Federal uh, Responsible Federal Budget has looked at both of your plans, and they say neither of you has a, a serious plan that is going to solve the fact that, that Medicare is going to run out of money in the 2020s, Social Security is going to run out of money in the 2030s, and at, at that time, recipients are going to take huge cuts in their benefits. So, in effect, the final question I want to ask you in this regard is, and let me start with you, Mr. Trump, would President Trump make a deal to save Medicare and Social Security that included both tax increases and benefit cuts, in effect, a grand bargain on entitlements? I'm cutting taxes. We're going to grow the economy. It's going to grow at a record rate. But that's going not going to help on no, entitlements. it's going to totally help you. And one thing we have to do, repeal and replace the disaster known as Obamacare. It's destroying our country. It's destroying our businesses, our small business, and our big businesses. We have to repeal and replace Obamacare. You take a look at the kind of numbers that that will cost us in the year 17. It is a disaster if we don't repeal and replace. Now, it's probably going to die of its own weight, but Obamacare has to go. It's, the premiums are going up 60, 70, 80 percent. Next year, they're going to go up over 100 percent. And I'm really glad that the premiums have started. At least the people see what's happening because she wants to keep Obamacare and she wants to make it even worse. And it can't get any worse. Bad health care at the most expensive price. We have to repeal and replace Obamacare. And Secretary Clinton, same question, because at this point, Social Security and Medicare are going to run out. The trust funds are going to run out of money. Will you as president entertain, will you consider 
a, a grand bargain, a deal that includes both tax increases and benefit cuts to try to save both programs. Well, Chris, I am on record as saying that we need to put more money into the Social Security Trust Fund. That's part of uh, my commitment to raise taxes on the wealthy. My Social Security payroll contribution will go up, as will Donald's, assuming he can't figure out how to get out of it. Uh, but what we want to do is to replenish the Social Such Security Trust woman. Fund by making sure that we have sufficient resources. And that will come from either raising the cap and or finding other ways to get more money into it. I will not cut benefits. I want to enhance benefits for low-income workers and for women who have been disadvantaged by the current Social Security system. But what Donald is proposing with these massive tax cuts will result in a $20 trillion additional national debt. That will have dire consequences for Social Security and Medicare. And I'll say something about the Affordable Care Act, which he wants to repeal. The Affordable Care Act extended the solvency of the Medicare Trust Fund. So if he repeals it, our Medicare problem gets worse. What we need to do is go Your after the long-term health care drivers. We've got to get costs down, increase value, emphasize wellness. I have a plan for doing that, and I think that we will be able to get entitlement spending under control is, by with more resources and is, smarter decisions. This is the final time, probably to both of your delight, that you're going to be on the stage together in this campaign. I would like to end it on a positive note. You had not agreed to uh, closing statements, but it seems to me in a funny way that might make it more interesting because you haven't prepared closing statements. So I'd like you each to take it. We're going to put a clock up a minute as the final question and the final debate to tell the American people why they should elect you to be the next president. This is another new mini-segment. Secretary Clinton, it's your turn to go first. Well, I would like to um, say to everyone watching tonight uh, that I'm reaching out to all Americans, Democrats, Republicans, and independents, because we need everybody to help make our country what it should be, to grow the economy, to make it fairer, to make it work for everyone. We need your talents, your skills, your commitment, your energy, your ambition. You know, I've been privileged to see the presidency up close, and I know the awesome responsibility of protecting our country and the incredible opportunity of working to try to make life better for all of you. I have made the cause of children and families uh, really my life's work. That's what my mission will be in the presidency. I will stand up for families against powerful interests, against corporations. I will do everything that I can to make sure that you have good jobs with rising incomes, that your kids have good educations from preschool through college. I hope you will give me a chance to serve as your president. Secretary Clinton, thank you. Mr. Trump? She's raising the money from the people she wants to control. It doesn't work that way. But when I started this campaign, I started it very strongly. It's called Make America Great Again. We're going to make America great. We have a depleted military. It has to be helped. It has to be fixed. We have the greatest people on earth in our military. We don't take care of our veterans. We take care of illegal immigrants, people that come into the country illegally better than we take care of our vets. That can't happen. Our policemen and women are disrespected. We need law and order, but we need justice, too. Our inner cities are a disaster. You get shot walking to the store. They have no education. They have no jobs. I will do more for African Americans and Latinos than she can ever do in 10 lifetimes. All she's done is talk to the African Americans and to the Latinos. But they get the vote, and then they come back. They say, we'll see you in four years. We are going to make America strong again, and we are going to make America great again, and it has to start now. We cannot take four more years of Barack Obama, and that's what you get when you get her. Thank you both. Secretary Clinton, ho hold on just a moment, folks. Secretary Clinton, Mr. Trump, I want to thank you both for participating in all three of these debates. That brings to an end this year's debate sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates. We want to thank the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and its students for having us. Now the decision is up to you. While millions have already voted, Election Day, November 8th, is just 20 days away. One thing everyone here can agree on, we hope you will go vote. It is one of the honors and obligations of living in this great country. Thank you, and good night.
Ja, het einde van dit debat, het einde van de reeks. Een korte reactie, Björn, op de slotbetogen van beide presidentskandidaten. Wat vond je? Wel, het mooiste slotbetoog was van de moderator. Voor mij was dat de ster van de avond. De man heeft het zeer strak, zeer goed geleid. Ja. De juiste vragen gesteld, kritisch voor iedereen. Maar de schok van de avond, wat toch veel overschaduwd is, dat Trump zei dat hij nog niet zeker weet of hij de verkiezingsuitslag zal, zal aanvaarden. Ja. Ik hou je op de hoogte, zei hij. Dat is natuurlijk vernietigend voor een democratie. Nooit eerder vertoond door een presidentskandidaat dat hij eigenlijk de indruk wekt dat de verkiezing niet eerlijk verloopt. En het zou zelfs tegen hem kunnen spelen. En dan beeld ik mij in hoe reageert of hoe, kijkt zijn, hoe kijken zijn partijgenoten dan achter de schermen naar, Wel ja, naar die quote, naar die uitspraak. Het kan gevolgen hebben voor die kiezers. Want als die kiezers zeggen, als het toch vervalst is, als het toch gemanipuleerd is, als het toch niet klopt wat er nu aan het gebeuren is, waarom moeten we dan nog gaan stemmen? Want het is toch een valse verkiezing. Dus hij kan zichzelf daarmee in de problemen brengen. Ja. Opvallend was wel, in het begin, zeer hoopgevend, het was een debat. Inhoudelijk? Het was een faire bokswedstrijd in het begin. Een bokswedstrijd met, met regels, sparringpartners. He, ze, ze, ze konden hun ding zeggen, het ging over inhoud, het ging over abortus, het ging over hun visie op uh, wapenrechten en wapendracht. Immigratie? Immigratie, maar daar is het dan beginnen ontsporen toen het plots over Poetin ging en toen Wikileaks, begon het, Putin, ja. maar toen daar begon het heeft, gebikkeld weer. Daar heeft Hillary Clinton zelf voor gezorgd, of mag ik dat niet Ze zeggen? heeft hem een beetje uitgelokt natuurlijk ja. en het is gelukt. Je moet niet veel doen om, Clinton uit, of om uh, Trump uit zijn tent te lokken. En van toen af ging het debat weer naar beneden en weer de oude retoriek van zij is een bedriegster en hij is een leugenaar en, enzovoort. Dus dat was wel een beetje jammer, maar ik blijf erbij. Het ging ergens over. Beter uh, dan vorige twee debatten? Ja. Wel, ik vond van wel. Je, je bleef beter volgen. En de, de kiezer die op zoek was naar informatie, namelijk informatie over wat denken ze daar nu eigenlijk over, over belastingen, ja. dan weet je het nu wel. Okay. Uh, als het ging over immigratie, de, de, de standpunten werden nog eens herhaald. Je zag die kandidaten ook vaak denken, oh, dat moet ik nog zeggen. Dat moest ik ook nog zeggen. Dus soms antwoordden ze wel op de vragen, maar soms gingen ze ook redelijk oeverloos door op, over wat ze zelf wilden zeggen. Maar op het einde vond ik het zeer ontgoochelend als ze één minuut de kans krijgen om het Amerikaanse volk toe te spreken dat geen enkele van de twee kandidaten inspirerend dat volk aanspreekt, recht in de camera kijkt en bijna ja, de mensen kan bewegen om voor hen te gaan stemmen. Ze wouden het ook niet doen, heb ik begrepen. Hè? Maar goed, daar gaan, we het zo dadelijk, daar gaan ja. we het zo dadelijk verder over hebben. Als, het, als, het, als alles goed gaat, ga ik nu naar onze man ter plaatse, Tom van de Wegen, onze reporter uh, voor het journaal, die een roadtrip aan het maken is door een de Verenigde Staten. Ja, Tom, jij hebt ook gekeken naar het debat. Waar heb je precies gekeken vannacht? Wel, ik ben uh, op de universiteitscampus in Terre Haute, uh, dat is een stadje in Indiana. En, en hier werd uh, vanavond de zogenaamde debate watch party gehouden. Zo'n 400 studenten hebben hier de hele avond het debat gevolgd op zijn Amerikaans met veel pizza en frisdrank. En er kon ook gestemd worden vanavond. En ja, Hillary Clinton werd hier met een overgrote meerderheid tot winnaar van de avond uitgeroepen. Ja, en, en hoe hebben de Amerikanen daar ter plaatse gereageerd? Tom, ik hoor je niet zo goed, maar hoe hebben ze gereageerd daar ter plaatse? Wel, dit is natuurlijk een universiteitspubliek, uh, dus er was best wat sfeer vanavond. Het eerste half uur ging het er in het debat heel beleefd aan toe. En ik zag heel wat studenten wat verveeld op hun stoel schuiven. Maar na de opwarming werd hier meermaals luid gelachen. Bijvoorbeeld toen het ging over immigratie en Trump zei dat er heel wat bad hombres uh, rondlopen. Of toen het ging over de marionet van Vladimir Poetin uh, en Trump meermaals wrong baste in de microfoon. Of toen hij telkens de microfoon... De moderator bedankte als hij iets kritisch zei over Clinton. Dat werkte hier ook op de lachspieren. Maar toen Trump zei dat uh, ja, niemand meer respect heeft voor vrouwen dan hem, dan werd hij echt uitgejouwd. Hè. Hij, ook, ook toen hij zei dat hij voorlopig weigerde om de uitslag van de verkiezingen te, herkennen, uh, te erkennen, dat werd op boegeroep onthaald. Dus ja, deze avond was hier voor Clinton. Dat vonden de studenten hier toch. Ja, de avond was voor Clinton. Dat is duidelijk. Hoe kijk je zelf? Hoe heb je zelf gekeken naar dat debat? Wat is jouw conclusie? 
Wel, het is de eerste keer toch dat ik uh, een inhoudelijk sterk debat hoorde, met inhoudelijk sterke argumenten. Inhoudelijk vond ik het dan ook het, het sterkste debat van de drie. Een debat waarvoor Trump duidelijk voor het eerst heel hard geoefend had. Uh, hij kwam ook meer beheerst over. Hij liet zich minder leiden door zijn temperament uh, tot het ging over buitenlandse brandhaarden. Daarna verloor hij toch wat zijn koel. Cool. Maar wat me nog opviel, was toch een sterke moderator, Wallace. Uh, hij bleef bijvoorbeeld Clinton wijzen op die recente Wikileaks, iets waar Trump hem meermaals ook voor bedankt. En ik moet zeggen dat Clinton daar zeer ontwijkend op antwoordde. Daar was ze vrij zwak, maar ook Trump kreeg meermaals kritiek van de moderator. Uh, bijvoorbeeld wanneer hij te horen kreeg dat hij volgens analisten ja, dat, dat zijn economisch plan niet realistisch uh, is. Trump gaf daar duidelijk geen antwoord op uh, waarom zijn cijfers niet kloppen. Maar samengevat, dit is niet echt het moddergevecht geworden zoals de vorige keer. Trump uh, speelde verder in op die antipolitieke gevoelens die bij veel Amerikanen toch nog altijd leven. En ja, terwijl Clinton duidelijk al verder keek dan deze verkiezing. Ik vond dat zij ja, zich vanavond meermaals als volgende president van Amerika gedroeg, niet meer als een kandidaat. Uh, dus ja, ze straalde veel zelfvertrouwen uit, uh, gesterkt door de goede peilingen natuurlijk. Ja, ik hoor het is duidelijk. Clinton wint het vannacht. Wel, hier, als het hier van de universiteitsstudent afhangt, toch wel, en ja, op, ook op mij heeft zij toch vanavond de sterkste indruk gemaakt, uh, zeker vergeleken met de vorige debatten. Ja. Oké, okay, dat is duidelijk. Tom, bedankt voor je tussenkomst. Ja, Björn, volg jij dat um, op een bepaald thema? Um, is Trump toch wel een beetje in elkaar gaan zakken als een pudding in het buitenlands beleid? Dat denk ik niet. Maar de kwestie is... Wie overtuigt nog de kiezers die twijfelen? Ja. En ik denk dat dit vanavond niet gebeurd is. We hebben al gemerkt in de peilingen en door de debatten dat de aanhang van Trump niet meer bedraagt dan hoogstens 40% van het kiespotentieel. Mm -hmm. Dat is niet verhoogd, dat kruimelt zelfs weg. Dus ze hebben hun eigen achterban overtuigd. Zij is natuurlijk heel presidentieel overgekomen vanavond. Het is inderdaad zoals Tom zegt. Clinton. Ze zei soms, Clinton, ja, ze zei soms al, in de eerste honderd dagen zal ik een plan lanceren om het pad naar burgerschap voor illegale vluchtelingen in orde te brengen. Dus ze gaat er al van uit of ze sprak al als president en ze moet nu nog drie weken wachten voor ze effectief de go krijgt om dat presidentschap te claimen. Dat is duidelijk volgens jou. Zij wordt de nieuwe president van de Verenigde Staten? Nee, het is nog drie weken. De peilingen liggen ver uiteen en er gaat een wonder moeten gebeuren om uh, Trump nog in het Witte Huis te helpen. Hij staat bij wijze van spreken 3-0 achter, maar we kennen dat in het voetbal. Soms komt iemand nog terug tot 4-3, maar de kans is zeer onwaarschijnlijk. Oké, okay, toch nog eens horen hoe de Amerikanen en andere mensen, zoals uh, politoloog Peter van Aalst, dat hebben beleefd daar in Las Vegas zelf. Want uh, meneer Van Aalst, u zit in Las Vegas en u zit al een tijdje die Amerikaanse presidentsverkiezingen te volgen. Uh, hoe hebt u dat daar beleefd, dat debat vannacht? Ja, het was een vrij normaal debat eigenlijk. Hè. Uh, je had, uh, het is een mengeling van het eerste en het tweede debat. Dus het was minder gemeen dan het vorige debat. En het was meer inhoudelijk dan het, uh, dan het, uh, dan het uh, vorige debat. Dus ik denk, ja, een vrij normaal debat eigenlijk. Ja, um, Clinton, kon zij of kwam zij liever presidentieel over of toch presidentieeler dan in de vorige twee debatten, denkt u? Uh, Clinton komt altijd presidentieel over. Um, als u bedoelt dat Trump een meer presidentiële indruk maakte, dat weet ik niet. Hij was rustiger, uh, maar hij blijft heel sterke uh, gebaren maken en overdrijvingen maken. Hij vergroot alles eigenlijk. En uh, ik denk dat dat goed uh, speelt bij zijn achterban, maar het was absoluut niet voldoende, denk ik, om uh, een twijfelende kiezer te overtuigen. Ja, dat is voor u duidelijk. Um, het wordt nog spannend naar de stembusgang. Denkt u? Uh, dat zou leuk zijn voor de journalisten en voor iedereen die dat volgt, maar ik denk het niet. Uh, dit debat was geen gamechanger. Um, het is een status quo. En uh, dat status quo is zeer groot in het voordeel van uh, Hillary Clinton. Dus ik denk niet dat dit debat daar iets aan zal veranderen. Ja, wat kan Trump nog eigenlijk doen om de boel te doen kenteren? Welke kaart kan hij trekken, denkt u? Uh, dat weet ik niet. Ik heb er vandaag niet echt één gezien. Uh, voor mij was het meest memorabele moment van dit debat. Het moment dat hij uh, zei dat hij nog niet zeker is of hij de uitslag zal herkennen. Uh, dat is toch voor mij als politicoloog ongezien dat een van de twee kandidaten voor het presidentschap nog niet zeker is of hij de uitslag zal herkennen op verkiezingsdag zelf. Hij, hij heeft aangegeven dat hij het op dat moment zal beslissen. 
dat vond ik uh, zeer vreemd. En ik denk niet dat het slim is voor hem. En het is zeer, uh, ja, ik zou durven zeggen, gevaarlijk voor de democratie. Ja, benieuwd wat dat wordt. Een sterke uitspraak van Trump, heb ik begrepen. Bedankt, Peter van Aalst vanuit Las Vegas. Um, ben je het daarmee eens um, met wat Van Aalst zegt? Dat Trump, wat hij moet doen om de boel te doen kenteren, dat dat niet duidelijk is? Dat is inderdaad niet duidelijk. Er zal iets onverwachts moeten gebeuren. En dit is de campagne van verwacht het onverwachte. Uh, er, kijk, drie weken geleden stonden ze nog bijna nek aan nek in de peilingen. En toen kwam dat debat en toen kwam de hele hijsa rond uh, die de mis, vrouwen. Die mis ja. de vrouwentape enzovoort. En het is helemaal ontspoord. En de vraag is, komt het nog goed? En de verwachting is, we denken het niet. Omdat er steeds meer mensen zijn van kiezersgroepen die hij moet aanspreken, vrouwen die hem verlaten. Als hij geen methodes vindt om bepaalde kiezers, waar hij nu zeer zwak scoort, toch een beetje beter te scoren, dan verliest hij. Het enige waar hij op kan hopen, want dat is bijna hopeloos, dat is dat de opkomst bij blanke mannen zo groot is, met 4% stijgt, daarvan nog eens 2% meer stemmen haalt dan Romney de vorige keer. Dat is zijn enige optie om nog te winnen. De boze blanke man. Want de Latino's, daar haalt hij bijna geen steun, 15, 16 procent. Bij de zwarten veel minder dan verwacht, ja. bij de vrouwen minder dan verwacht, bij de millennials al helemaal niet. En kenmerkend vind ik voor deze hele situatie is dat een kwart van de jonge mensen zegt we verkiezen nog liever een meteorietinslag waarbij de planeet wordt vernietigd dan één van deze twee als president van de VS te zien. Dat toont toch de moeheid en de ontgoocheling in beide kandidaten. Een sterke uitspraak, maar ook wel, onthoud ik, Buren, het sterkste debat van de drie Absoluut. die we samen hebben bekeken. Bedankt voor je tussenkomst en je analyse bij alle drie de debatten. En voor ons zit het erop. We hebben alle drie de debatten gehad. Gaat u zo dadelijk naar de redactie.be, dan vindt u ook opnieuw alle analyses, hoogtepunten, samenvattingen op de redactie via Amerika Kiest. De herhalingen ziet u, als ik het goed heb, om vijf, zeven, negen en half twee. Dus u hebt tijd genoeg om alles opnieuw te herbekijken. En dan restloos nog één ding. De verkiezingsnacht die kan u ook hier volgen op Canvas met Annelies Beck en Stef Meerbergen. Tien uur lang op Canvas en daarna uiteraard ook ons ochtendjournaal met Hanne de Kouter. Allemaal dus Amerika kiest. Bedankt voor het kijken. Tot dan. Een blik achter de schermen van de verkiezingen. Anthony Weiner is een reizende ster in de politiek. And the will observe regular order. Never back down from anybody. Tot hij dit tweet op. Hij zet door. I don't quit. En wil burgemeester van New York worden. Zondag op Canvas. This is the worst. Doing a documentary on my scandal. Hallo, u kijkt naar Winteruur en ik ben daar net tegen een glazen deur gelopen. Frank van der Linden. Dank u wel, dank u wel. Welkom in Winteruur, Danira Boekris. Bart Moejaard. Welkom, Hilde van Niegem. Oh, oh, oh. Wouter Torfs. Het fenomeen uh, Stijn Meuris. Lise Spit. Henk Rijkaar. Gerda den Doven. Mauro Pavlovski. Jan Mulder. Jonas van Thielen. Welkom, Rudy Franks. Goed voorgelezen trouwens. Slaap wel. Wim Helze, Boris en een reeks nieuwe gasten. Winteruur vanaf maandag 31 oktober terug op Canvas. Ben Boy. Hi Ben. My name is Jessica. You want to fuck with somebody? You do it to their face. You hear me, tough guy? Sorry. Uh, how about social networking sites? You visit those? You just want to chat. En dat kan zware gevolgen hebben. No one's ever gonna help us. I'm gonna find that guy myself. Nooit meer veilig op het net. Disconnect, een film die je moet zien. Vrijdag op Canvas.
Goedemorgen. Heb je het begin van het debat tussen Clinton en Trump eerder vannacht gemist? Dan kan je nu kijken naar de herhaling. Nog 19 dagen en dan weten we na een intense verkiezingscampagne wie de nieuwe president is van de Verenigde Staten van Amerika. Wordt het Hillary Clinton? Ze heeft heel veel politieke kilometers op haar teller, maar ze is toch geen onbeschreven blad. Op dit moment staat ze in alle peilingen voor op haar rivaal Donald Trump. De omstreden anti-establishment kandidaat die ons toch nog in alle spanning ja, aan het wachten houdt. Want wat wordt zijn volgende zet na alle heisa van afgelopen dagen? Het is een vraag die ik voorleg aan onze Amerika-watcher Björn Soenes, die op dit derde en allerlaatste debat samen met u en mij meekijkt naar dit debat tussen Hillary Clinton en Donald Trump. Fijn dat u er weer bij bent vannacht. Dit is Amerika kiest. Hillary Clinton is going to be a horrible president. Imagine him in the Oval Office. Crooked Hillary, crooked Hillary. He is temperamentally unfit. Ja, Björn, all eyes on Trump. Alle ogen op Trump vannacht, hè? Ja, de vraag is hoe laag zal hij gaan? Zullen onze ogen en oren alweer pijn doen? Hè? Na het tweede debat, wat een absoluut dieptepunt was in de, de politieke geschiedenis van Amerika, hoe laag zullen ze beide vanavond gaan? Zal het over en weer uh, geteuter en over en weer verwijten weer doorgaan? We weten het niet, want dit is de verkiezing van de onverwachte gebeurtenis. Dat kan je wel zeggen. Trump ligt zo ver achter dat hij eigenlijk niets meer te verliezen heeft. Niets meer te verliezen. Zes procent zou je achter liggen? Gemiddeld. Gemiddeld. De meeste peilingen zijn zeven, acht procent verschil overal achter in strijdstaten. Dus het kan een afslachting worden. Maar er is niet veel meer nodig om de peiling weer te doen keren. Maar hoe hij Toch? dat zal doen... Hij kan dat doen, maar dan moet hij vanavond wel enorme prestaties leveren. En de vraag is, zal dat helpen? Want de meeste mensen hebben hun gedacht al vastgelegd. De vraag is ook, hoe zal Clinton reageren? Zij moet eigenlijk niet al te veel doen. Ze moet rustig blijven. Terug berekend en goed voorbereid, zoals altijd, zoals we Hillary Clinton kennen. En iets meer ten aanval trekken dan in het tweede debat. In het tweede debat had zij niet langer het initiatief. Dat lag bij Trump in het eerste debat had zij dat wel. En Trump moest in de verdediging. En we weten allemaal, als hij zich aangevallen voelt, dan begint hij ja, uit te halen. En dan heeft hij zichzelf niet altijd onder controle. Dus daar moeten we op letten. En hopelijk gaat het ook weer over onderwerpen. Er zijn zes onderwerpen vanavond. Vertel eens. Uh, dat moet gaan over immigratie. Het moet gaan over buitenlandse hotspots. Dus uh, moeilijke gebieden. Syrië, Irak, ja. Afghanistan, IS. Het moet ook gaan over het Hoge Rechtshof. Dat is belangrijk, omdat daar een rechter moet benoemd worden. Die al sinds februari is overleden. Die moet vervangen worden. De Republikeinen houden dat tegen. Dat is belangrijk voor de toekomst van de rechtspraak in ja. de VS. En het zal gaan over schulden in Amerika. En over uitkeringen voor uh, mensen die het sociaal moeilijk hebben. Okay. En de, de debatleider is een strenge debatleider. Iemand die de mensen roostert. Chris Wallace van Fox News. Fox News, conservatieve televisiezender. Dat is cruciaal. Speelt ook in het voorbeeld van voordeel liever van Trump? Vannacht? Ja en nee. Hij is zogezegd ooit de vriend geweest van Fox. Maar Chris Wallace staat bekend dat hij zelfs harder is voor democraten dan voor republikeinen. Als hij ze, of voor republikeinen, republikeinen dan, voor dan voor democraten. Als hij ja. ze interviewt. Dus hij staat wel bekend als een zeer goed journalist. Als iemand die doorvraagt en roostert. De vraag is, hoe gaat Clinton daarmee om? Als ze geroosterd wordt over Wikileaks. Over de video die gelekt is. Waarbij blijkt dat ook zij in haar campagne vuile technieken gebruikt om Trump rallies te verstoren. Ja. Hoe gaat uh, Trump reageren als hij geroosterd wordt over de aanklachten van vrouwen enzovoort? Dus hopelijk gaat het niet te veel over persoonlijke dingen, maar gaat het ook ergens over de toekomst van Amerika. En op het einde zullen ze voor het allerlaatst de, de, de natie kunnen toespreken met hun boodschap voor de Amerikanen. Waarom hij of zij ja. de president mag worden voor, uh, voor uh, het Witte Huis. Hè? Um, je spreekt over onderwerpen. Um, welk onderwerp spreekt in deze in het voordeel van, van Trump? Ik, ik denk dan aan immigratie. Um, Tuurlijk, immigratie. immigratie hè, de 11 miljoen illegalen waar hij streng wil tegen optreden. Ook de schulden. Amerika heeft ondertussen een totale schuld van bijna 20.000 miljard dollar. Dat is heel veel. Um, wat gaat er gebeuren? Welke beleidsinitiatieven moeten er komen om die schuld naar beneden te helpen? Hij kan dat goed managen, want hij is een manager, een, 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 een ja, ondernemer, zo zegt hij altijd. Ja en nee, maar als je kijkt naar de programma's, dan uh, stelt Trump een belastingverlaging voor zowat iedereen voor. Dus dan zou de schuld wel eens nog met een paar duizend miljard kunnen toenemen. Dus ja, die, die programma's moeten ook betaald worden als je beleid voert. Dus daar kan hij dan weer geroosterd worden door, door de moderator. Ja, de moderator. Trouwens, wordt dit weer een psychologische oorlogsvoering? 
Ik heb gezien dat Trump ook een speciale gast heeft uitgenodigd uh, vannacht. De halfbroer, de Keniaanse halfbroer van uh, ja. president Obama. Well, Malik dat? Obama is de halfbroer inderdaad van de president. Hij is nooit een grote fan geweest van zijn broer en is eigenlijk een republikein. En hij is voor Trump, omdat hij vindt dat zijn broer het niet altijd best heeft gedaan. Die is uitgenodigd samen met de moeder van een slachtoffer van de aanslag van een terreuraanslag in Benghazi, waar vier Amerikanen zijn omgekomen. Mm -hmm. En de moeder van een jonge man die daar is omgekomen, zit daar ook en die is... Die, die stelt Clinton persoonlijk verantwoordelijk voor de dood van haar zoon. Maar dat is dan psychologisch. Die mensen mogen niet, zoals in nee. het tweede debat, ook nee. een vraag stellen. Nee. Uh, het enige wat we weten uh, is dat er is één moderator is. Er is publiek, maar dat publiek moet stil zijn. heeft geen inbreng. Het is dus een beetje zoals het eerste debat. Journalist ondervraagt uh, de kandidaten drie keer of zes keer een kwartier over een onderwerp. Iedere keer twee minuten spreektijd, een minuut doorgaan. Maar de vraag is... We hebben twee kandidaten gezien die elkaar voortdurend onderbreken, vooral Trump, in hoeverre hij dat in de hand zal kunnen houden. Hij onderbreekt de moderator, heeft ook heel veel kritiek op de moderator. Vraag is of hij dat ook zal hebben op de huidige moderator van Fox, maar ook op de verkiezingen aan zich. Dat is één Zeer grote grap volgens Trump. Zeer gevaarlijk. Ja, hij, hij zit constant um, het bericht de wereld in te sturen dat deze verkiezing nu al vervalst is. Zeer ja, gevaarlijk dat, waarom? Gevaarlijk om als hij inderdaad verliest hebben zijn aanhangers of een deel van zijn aanhang al gezegd wij gaan stampij maken, we gaan ruzie maken, we gaan uh, vechtpartijen organiseren. Wij aanvaarden de uitslag niet. Dat zou de eerste keer zijn in de geschiedenis van de VS dat een kandidaat, als hij rechtmatig verliest, zijn verlies niet erkent. En dat is toch wel uh, dubieus. En eigenlijk is dat ook al een beetje de winst.